Good evening and welcome to the Stryker Center. I am Marjorie Schuster, our coordinator of our literary events here at Temple Emanuel. We have a very, very exciting semester ahead with over 40 events, both held virtually and in person. Please take a look at our website and join us often. Tonight, we have a very special and important conversation and we're so pleased that David DeSteno was with us. He's the author of four books, and, the, and a professor of psychology at Northeastern University. His newest book, How, How God Works, The Science Behind the Benefits of Religion is an important and valuable read. In discussion with him this evening is Krista Tibbet, journalist and author and host of the public radio program On Being. As always, please write your questions in the chat feature of Zoom and we will get to as many as we can. It is now my pleasure to welcome David DeSteno and Krista Tibbet. Hello. Hi. Hi, David. Hi, Krista. <laughs> well, it's good to be here. And I put the word here in quotation marks. The meaning of that has changed for all of us in the last 18 months. But um, what a gift it is to be able to gather um, in this way from our different places. Um, and congratulations on this book. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for agreeing to host me. Oh, well, absolutely. Um, you know, I've, I, I was thinking as I was getting ready for this evening, um, I feel like there was at some point in my project a realization that what I'm really, what, what drives my project at its core is uh, my curiosity about the animating questions behind our religious traditions. The questions that these traditions in some ways arose to address. What does it mean to be human and how do we want to live and who will we be to each other? And that, and these are also the abiding, enduring, universal human questions. And but in previous centuries and generations, humanity was guided by theologians and philosophers in posing these questions. And I feel like I've watched in this young century scientists, neuroscientists, physicists, psychologists, researchers walk onto this territory in such an interesting way in a way that feels um, feels important for our species. Um, so that it is not shocking in uh, 2021 that we have a book called How God Works, The Science Behind the Benefits of Religion, but that is a new phenomenon in Western civilization. And, you know, when I look at the first paragraph of your book, um, you pose these questions, which to me are, are variations on those universal human questions. How do you raise your child to be a good person? What are your responsibilities to your family, your friends, and your community? How do you cope with a serious illness? Can you find someone to love? And if you do, how do you go on when they're gone? How do you find joy and meaning in life, especially in difficult times? And how do you make sense of your life's inevitable end? And you make it very clear also from the beginning of the book that these are not questions you intended to be attending to as a scientist, uh, much yeah. less when you began your career writing a book about. Yeah, that's true. I, although in some ways I do feel like it's a little bit full circle to, for me. When I was a, uh, an undergraduate in college, I was trying to decide between being a religious studies major and a psychologist because I was interested in those in those just enduring pan-human questions that, yeah. that you were mentioning. And I decided, well, I'm going to be a psychologist because I can run experiments and I can get data rather than debate things. But those questions always animated me. And what I found over time was that the answers we were finding, as you're saying, we we social scientists, we're we're really the new kids on the block. We're going mm -hmm. at these questions, but for millennia, people turned to rabbis, priests, imams, shamans for them. And I began to have kind of a, a humbling realization that every new life hack we found, every new technique we found that helped people find connection, help them become more ethical, help them become more happy. Everywhere I looked, I was like, oh, wait, <laughs> they're using that in this ceremony. They're using that in, in that ritual there. And for a scientist, you never like to be scooped. But what I began to realize was that there is a vast knowledge in, in religious traditions. And, and to say I was surprised by that is kind of a, a sense of scientific hubris. And I think that's the problem right now with a lot of scientists. A lot of people assume religion is just superstition. 
But how could millennia of, of thought that went into trying to help people meet with the deal with the challenges of life not have something to offer? And so my goal in this book is to begin to bring the two together to say, let's take a scientific lens to see how these practices help us. And what can we learn from that? We've started to do that as a society with meditation, mm-hmm. but it can't be the only one. Right. Yeah. Right. We don't talk about that very much. So the question is, is what's the next mindfulness? It's out there Mm -hmm. for willing to look. And we have to have enough intellectual humility to do that. Well, and if you look at the fullness of human history and human cultures, as you say, there's much more to it than mindfulness meditation. Yeah. As 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 much a gift as that is to humanity at this time, and actually to people in many, many traditions. Mm -hmm. Um but it seems to me that really, and tell me if this is right, that you just started to see this data, which is the language um, that you speak as a researcher, um, mm-hmm. that engaging in spiritual practice affects the health, the longevity, uh, and the capacity for happiness in, in a human life. And that, that that drove your curiosity forward. Yeah, so there's there's wonderful data. This data is in mine, but it comes from the Harvard Center for Human Flourishing, which shows, and Pew and lots of other, the Mayo Clinic, lots of other people have the same type of finding, which says believing in God doesn't really predict much, but engagement in regular engagement in spiritual practices, in, in prayer, in the rituals of your faith, in meditation, whatever it might be, people who do that tend to live longer, healthier, and happier lives. And so as a scientist, that to me is undeniable. There is something there. In those practices, there are tools that help us live better lives. And I think it's incumbent on us to explore what those are. And in my lab, one thing we started with, again, we started with meditation because, you know, scientists were studying that, Mm -hmm. but we weren't interested in whether it made people's, you know, gray matter or white matter thicker, it affected your memory. Um, It was designed to increase people's compassion to reduce suffering in the world. And so to make a long story short, we ran experiments, we had people come and they would meditate with the Buddhist Lama, and then we would send them off into the world And we would use actors who would come up in front of them looking like they were in pain or they needed help. And we found a dramatic upswing in by threefold in people who were engaged in eight weeks of meditation, spontaneously wanting to go and help these actors who appeared to be in pain. And what that tells me, and and I I owe you a debt here. I I, I use your term spiritual technologies here. These are, (laughs) these are, these are tools that we can use that help us change the way we are. Mm. And to me, that was just, amazing that, you know, religions aren't telling you only be kind, be generous, be good, but they're giving you tools that help Mm -hmm. you do that. And so we began to look at all of our other work and the work of a lot of other people in the field, and we began to see all these connections. And, you know, that's, that's my goal is to foster that, that conversation, something I know you've been trying to foster for a long time. Yeah. And what you, what you've also been pointing at and kind of documenting is this um, connection between in inner life, interior life, and 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 presence in the world, um, the behavior, lived behavior, mm-hmm. um, which I think I think a a sense of that got lost as religion became so privatized, mm-hmm. you know, in the twentieth century. Um, it has public effect, right? In in individual lives, is what you are kind of taking yeah. into the laboratory. Exactly. I mean, how does it affect? How do how do spiritual practices affect? how we treat one another. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I mean, religion is about belief. It's about community. It's about the things that, that sustain us. And if you look at human nature, you can see the best, most wonderful examples of kindness and generosity, and you can see examples of selfishness. And the ideals of, of, of religion and even secular values can align, right? I'm not going to say you need religion to be a good person in this world mm-hmm. by any means. But what I'm finding is that it gives us tools that, that help us get that way. So let me let me give you one example. One thing we study in my lab is the uh, emotion gratitude. Mm-hmm. And what we find is that when we make people feel grateful, grateful to their friends, to their family, to God, whatever it might be that they feel grateful to, they become more honest. And again, you know, we don't ask people would you be honest? Because what are they going to say? They're, they, no one's going to say, no, yes, I would lie. Mm-hmm. Or I think a lot of people assume they would be generous and kind, but when push comes to shove, sometimes we're not. 
um, but we'll give them the opportunity to cheat, to make money, to help people, uh, again, using all actors and setups. And what we find is that when people feel grateful, they become more honest, they cheat less, they become more generous, they are more patient. These are all virtues that are important for social living. They're all virtues that, that religions foster in us. Um, but if you're a Christian, you say, you know, grace at meals. If you're Jewish, every morning when you wake up, you say the Moda Ani prayer and give thanks that you're returned to earth for another day. These aren't just nice things to do. What they're doing is cultivating an emotion in us regularly that then alters how we treat other people. And so to me, that's the wonder here, that, that the religions are, are ritualizing these things that affect our bodies and minds to help us be better people. Yeah, I think some people <clears throat> would look, and many, there are many ways to look at this research and analyze it, but one way would be that what it says is that religion isn't really necessary, that we can isolate um, mm -hmm these qualities by science and secularize them. But another way to look at it is that there has been this profound intelligence um, that 21st century science is only now catching up with. That's right. In many ways, you can think of, of, of religion as running its own experiments of sorts. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to debate theology because there is no test if, if God exists. And I make that very clear. That just gets us yelling at each other. Yeah, right? you, so also, not, you also say, you say we all can and should work while respecting everyone's isms. Right. We should and and atheism also right. is an ism. Right, right, exactly. Atheism is an ism. Yeah, every, just, just like, you know, Republicanism and democraticism, liberalism can get people arguing, even though we agree on a lot. It's the same problem. So let's put our isms to the side and respect them but we can study these practices and find out how they work. And what's amazing is the way religions have packaged these, these rituals together. When, when, you, when you say the rosary or when you sing Hindu kirtan, or when you engage in chanting, what that does is it alters your breathing rate. And mm -hmm. by slowing your breathing rate, it tells your brain you are in a, in a safer place. It then lead, makes it easier for people to form connection with each other. There are just wonderful things all built in together to help us solve these, these problems of life. And you can think about them as divinely inspired. You can think about them as coming from people trying stuff out. I don't have the answer to that. Mm -hmm. I think both answers should be respected, but there's a brilliance in them because for centuries they have been honed to help us deal with challenges. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm interested in how you organize the book. Um, mm -hmm the organizing principle is kind of a stages of a human life. Yeah. 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 We start up, we start at birth and, and, and we go to death. And, and yeah. Uh, how did you come to that idea? Was that obvious to you when you started? No, to order it, this? It, it actually wasn't obvious to me. And, and I, I have to, and I always do give full credit to my, to my editor, Eamon Dolan, who um, came up with that. And, and once he said that, I was like, yeah, that's exactly what, what we need to do because the argument is simply, you know, parents face challenges of, of, of bonding with children and anxieties around birth. And you go to the formative years, how do you instill morality? How do you make that transition to, to adulthood? As we, as we age, we have to deal with health crises, midlife crises, and then we ultimately deal with losing people we love and confronting our own death. And so the book is, is organized along that path of life at each stage, looking at the commonalities. Yeah. Yeah, let's let's just I mean, let's go through them quickly because it, it, yeah. it was really fascinating to me. So beginning with infancy. So what does all of this science have to say about that? And and how is that a place to begin? It's a fascinating place to begin. Yeah. So beginning with infancy, one thing that is is often a problem for for many parents, is, especially new parents, is the 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 worry and the anxiety that goes along with, yeah. with having a new child. And, you know, if you think about children, they, they are demanding when they're, we love them, um, but they can be demanding. And some people can begin to feel overwhelmed by, by that. And the psychologist, Alison Gopnik uh, often says, and I love this saying, you know, sometimes we, we care for people because we love them, but mm -hmm. sometimes we love them because we care for them. It's that act of caring that itself makes us we want to 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 give more to our yeah. to our children. And if you look at the the ethnographic literature, one of the places where you find the strongest bond between mother and child in terms of time spent together and emotional closeness is in is in Japan. 
Mm. And if you look at Shinto, which is the one of the main religions of Japan, you see all these rituals around caring for the child and showing how special he or she is. It starts even before birth. Um, family and friends will wrap a sash around the pregnant mom's belly to, to protect mm. the child. And then there's a ceremony when the child is born, when the child is named, when you go to the temple for the first time, first bite of food. And what all of these things do is they're public, because the parents put these ceremonies together, they're public recognitions and reminders of how much we value this child. Mm. And the more you have public reminders of how much you value a child, the more your brain begins to say, yeah, this, this is something really important. And it's been shown to help bonding. I and mean, if you talk to pediatricians, they'll often tell you if you're having trouble bonding to your child, make time every day to spend time, massage the baby, have story mm. time with them. And, and these are kind of secularized versions of what Shinto does. Shinto, because of the numerous rituals that go around with showing gratitude to a child, it makes your mind realize how worthwhile this child is. And it below your conscious radar makes it easier to value and to bond to that child. Mm. And that's bringing new humans into the world that we're talking about there, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. And then the, the formative years. Yeah. The formative years are, are, you know, how do we, how do we instill kind of ethics and morality into children. And one thing I talked about already was, you know, the emotion of gratitude. There are other emotions there as well that become very important. Why do most religions oftentimes uh, read story about very noble characters to, um, to young children, you know, saints in Christianity, sages in, in other religions? Um, when we see someone do something good, it creates in us this, this emotion that's known as elevation, which is basically, you know, if you see someone do an immensely kind act. And when we feel that emotion, it makes us want to emulate it. And so all of these stories that you're reading about, you know, the saints or the sages or, or, or noble people are creating that emotion. And that emotion helps reorient our values to want to help. Prayers of gratitude that you learn when you're a child make you more likely to be kind to be honest. Mm -hmm. And again, the trick, right, is do them regularly. It's when you do them regularly that you see the benefits because you're cultivating, you know, all of these, these, these wonderful um, emotional states. Mm. So let's do coming of age and twenties and thirties together. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, coming of age is, is how do we move to, to adolescence and yeah. If you see many, many traditional cultures, oftentimes they have rituals that are that are focused on 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 pain, um, showing some type of of, of self-control uh, mm. to, to face challenges. So um, in Native American societies, girls will uh, adolescent girls will do the sunrise ceremony, which is hours and hours and hours of, of dancing and, and, and they can't stop. In the Sateri Mawe in, in the Amazon, the boys put on gloves that have bullet ants in them and they're called bullet ants because their bite stinks like, like a bullet. Um, and what you do is you, you show that you can in fact um, have this type of self-control and it's a very profound thing to be able to withstand this and it changes how you view yourself. But fundamentally, it also changes how those around you view you. So when you watch somebody go through something in pain, research shows that your heart rates synchronize with them. You begin to feel a connection with them. And in that kind of liminal state, you can begin to see them in a new, in a new way. And when the, you know, the, the young boys and girls come out of this, they are now treated as adults. And that's the important part there because the community now treats them differently and it keeps that new mature version of themselves going. One problem I think we have, right, in, in more modern day society. So if you look at, at, at bar and bat mitzvahs, um, mm -hmm. there it's, it's, it's focused more on, on developing specialized knowledge. And in modern society, it's knowledge that, that really matters more than, than, than kind of physical physicality. Um, but the problem I think for us in, in society of these rituals, helping us, helping our youth really feel like they're adults is there's not one age in our culture when you're an adult, right? You can mm -hmm. vote at one age, you drink at another age, you drive <laughs> at another age. And so the question is, how do we help our, our children gain the sense of adulthood? 
And as I say in the book, I, I think what we need to do is adopt what some other cultures do is they do this iteratively. That is, there are multiple ceremonies as you reach different ages. Mm. And I think for our society, that might be a good way to do it because there is no one age when you're an adult. You know, the day after your bat mitzvah or the day after I was confirmed in the Catholic Church, people didn't start treating me like adults. <laughs> you know, you go back school and you're doing the same thing you, you know, always do. It's, it's almost what you're talking about. If I think about that image you, you spoke about in, in Japan of the, of the, the binding and the, it's almost like a, it's like, it's almost like a, a laying it on of hands communally mm-hmm. uh, at different stages in the life of a human being. We, we just it don't, is. we don't have rites of passage. We don't have communal rites of passage in this culture. We don't. And, and I mean, if, if you think so, you know, Except in religions, really. Except except in religions. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we need more of that. And so, you know, one example in a secular way that I talk about is, is the example of, of being an Eagle Scout, right? You have to go through multiple stages, showing multiple competencies. And at each step along the way, you are recognized for it. And at the end, you are seen, you know, as, a, as, as an Eagle Scout or as someone who's, you know, has, has a lot of the qualities that many people would aspire to. Um, I think for us, we need to have rituals, whether they're religious or secular, that when they occur for adolescence, the community, as you say, lays on the hands and accepts that there is a change. Not that we kind of go back to doing what we were just doing before. Um, and I think for mm-hmm. us, and you know, an iterative way of doing that makes the most sense because we, and age, for each child, you know, every child, every adolescent is ready for the same level of maturity at the same age. And so it can be at, when you're ready for this milestone, we have a ceremony to acknowledge that. This ceremony, this age is ceremony to acknowledge that. And if we do that, I think we can better attune our rites of passage because I think you're absolutely right. Right now, we don't have a really good way for our teens to become adults in the eyes of the community around them. Mm-hmm. And a very a big theme um, in your book, as in human culture, is this question of happiness. Yeah. And it's fascinating how much you are really studying that yeah, as we go through midlife, through through yeah, through midlife. What, what is midlife anyway? That would be another hour we could spend. I think that yeah. all of that is shifting. Yeah. And you know, into into older age. Um, again, which is all so relative um, in such an interesting way now. Um, but you really do find also that this emphasis in religious traditions on service, uh, contrary to everything we're told about, about what happiness uh, means in yeah. terms of acquiring and performing yeah. and succeeding, um, that too is, is, is a brilliance and that it, you, re- you really have documented that engaging in service is a key to this elusive thing. It is. In fact, you know, America's research shows when Americans want to be happier, they they want to learn a new skill or they want to buy something. And that doesn't typically work in the long run. What brings true happiness, exactly as you're saying, is is, is connection to those we love and, and service and participating in something that we consider to be meaningful beyond ourselves. But, you know, here's a, a beautiful part of, of ritual where this happens. And I know many folks at, at Stryker, you've you've just come through the, the days of awe. So you've had Rosh Hashanah and you've had Yom Kippur. And the interesting thing about Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is the both, right? They, they kind of capture the beginning of life and, and the end of life. Mm-hmm. But on both, you say the prayer, the, the Unatana Tokef. And I, I won't be able to say it right, so please forgive me. But, but in there, there is this part that says, who will live and who will die? Mm-hmm. Who will die before their time? Who in the next year is going to die from fire, from flood, from sword, from plague? And that last one, I think, a lot of people this year given the COVID-19 pandemic. And what's really going on there is a reminder that the length of life is not a guarantee. It's a gift. And it may the end may come sooner than you think. For Christians, this is done with Ash Wednesday. Um, when people have reminders that death may come sooner than they think, it reorients their values. There's a lot of work on this, such that they turn away from valuing kind of 
material things, getting a new skill, trying to get ahead in life, toward things that bring true happiness, time with family, time with friends, engaging in meaning, kind of like if you those of you who read David Brooks, David Brooks is the second mountain, it's kind of that type of direction. And if you look at happiness in general across the lifespan, it kind of hits a nadir around 50, and then it starts going up again. Mm -hmm. By the time you're 60 or 70, people are, are, are making this change themselves because they feel like their life, you know, they can see the end coming. And so they reorient their values. But during pandemics, uh, that difference in the old and the young goes away. As we saw with COVID, even the young now were turning their attention toward wanting to spend time with, with family and friends. We're now in the midst of the great resignation because people are have that realization and they're leaving their jobs and, and, and their careers to find meaning. But these rituals, Yom Kippur, Ash Wednesday, they're reminders of that without having to have a pandemic, thank God. They're mm -hmm. reminders that death can come sooner than any of us think. And when that happens, it reorients our values. And you don't need to wait once a year to do that. Right? As Thomas the Tempus, the, the medieval scholar said, live every day as if you might die before evening. And when you go to bed every evening, don't promise yourself you're gonna wake up the next morning. Mm -hmm. And it sounds kind of morbid, but what it really is, is a way to ensure that that coming year is going to bring more joy. And that's why you see it uh, right before Yom Kippur and right in Ash Wednesday, right before the period of Lent. Those are both times of self-reflection and taking stock. And this reminder that you might not be here kind of loosens up our brain and allows us to reorient our values toward what it, really matters. It really reorients towards life, yeah, ironically. Right. So I know you're sensitive to this, but um, how do you think about, um, you know, these rituals that you're speaking of are embedded in Judaism and Christianity and mm -hmm. Islam um, in tradition and community yeah. and wisdom traditions and elders and texts and arts and the conversation across generation um, that flows through all of these things. So how do you, how do you work with that notion of um, shining a light on what is fascinating and important to know and the danger of cultural appropriation yeah. um, and just kind of adapting and singling out uh, elements of religious rit ritual and religious life. Yeah, it's a good question. And there, you know, there are, there are two points there. One is, is the issue of, of, of respect, right? That is we, we don't want to extract things from anybody's faith in a way that kind of, kind of, um, not monetizes it, but kind of, you know, makes it a product, productizes it. Um, and so, but I think there's a way to do it in the sense that, um, you know, if if you look at, and I hope we have time to talk about this, you know, the 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 morning ritual of, of Shiva, there are wonderful elements of Shiva that can be incorporated without taking the prayers, without taking the symbols. I would never want to take another religion's symbols or prayers or theology. But, you know, there are wonderful elements of it such that, you know, it's it's a mitzvot that is you have to go and visit people when when there's been a death. And we know that providing that kind of support is really helpful. Um, why not make that a habit to do that for seven days, even if you're not Jewish? Why not have meetings in, where you come together in in not a Jewish minion, but groups of people together who might sing and, and remember together and and. Uh, do other things as well. You know, one of the beauties of Shiva also is when you cover mirrors, you know, why do you cover mirrors? Well, there's a theological reason, but there's psychological research that shows when you look into a mirror, whatever emotion you are feeling becomes intensified. If you're happy, you become mm -hmm. happier. If you're sad, you become sadder. So mm -hmm. during periods of grief, covering mm -hmm. mirrors is a way to reduce that grief. Again, brilliance, all these things put together. You can do that. So in the way that, that you can meditate without the Buddhist theology, I think you can incorporate many of these elements um, without showing disrespect to the the theology of the um, of the religion. But then there's also the issue of how well does it work, right? I think in mm -hmm. in meditation, what worries me is all these people are now meditating alone in their rooms. That's mm -hmm. not the way it normally happens. Within a Buddhist, you know, sangha, you would do this in in community, and there would be blessings, and there would be communal activities. And so that's another question besides appropriation is, is how well do these things work when they're separated from their original context? 
Yes, I'm. Just, you know, there's some really wonderful questions coming in, and um, there's one from Bob, which I think is um, is pointing exactly at this. You know, do you think wholly secular people can use this evolutionary adaptation towards religion to be happy, short of actually developing a faith or superstition? Um, uh, and I, I think to that question that you just posed, certainly you can use these, but is, is that an open question for you? If the fullness of the effect is there completely the devoid of the tradition? Yeah, because, because we certainly know that that belief does things as well. So I, I think there are certainly elements that you can take um, of the way that we, we, we physically do these things, right? They, they, they affect our bodies when we're together our heart rate synchronizes, our breathing synchronizes. When we kneel and sing together, we feel more connection to each other. I can bring you into my lab and we've done this and we have people put on earphones and they hear tones and they move their bodies at the same time if the tones are unis and done in unison or they move them out of sync. And we show that when, the, when they do them in sync, they feel more connection and compassion mm -hmm. to each other's way to build community. But there's also other evidence that when you add in belief and singing of the hymns that are meaningful with that synchrony, the effect is even larger. Mm. So for me, the question is, what can we take and what can we learn from this? But I don't think that without the belief, the full experience of it will be there. But that doesn't mean there's there's not wonderful things that we can learn. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are questions about the pandemic. And you, it, it seems to me that you were writing this or did you finish editing? I mean, you mentioned the pandemic in the book. Were you writing it or did you maybe finish the editing? Finish the editing during a lot finish of those the editing during prior the pandemic. To the pandemic. Yeah, uh, I mean, you mentioned mourning and I, it, it, I, I thought so much in the last year and a half about uh, our need for communal ways to mourn and grieve and, you mm -hmm. know, just even the language of lamentation Mm -hmm. uh, feels like something we could have used. Um, you know, Susan is asking, I don't know, you know, about thoughts and fears during the pandemic. Um, curious about how, yeah. how the pandemic maybe, um, you know, affected your thinking and writing, uh, and maybe perhaps were there things that you saw and understood because of that collective human experience we had? Yeah, so just to take a step back, if, if you look at during what happened during the pandemic, um, people turned toward religion, even, even many people who never prayed before began to pray and began to seek help. And it's, it's because we are facing this challenge in life. And I think what became especially pernicious about the pandemic was that we couldn't do it together. We were all home, yeah. right? So normally, right, if, if you if you had the sense that you wanted to pray, even if you were a person who wasn't very religious, you would go to the temple, you would go to your mosque, you would go to your church. And there, there you would find community. And these rituals together would use their magic working on our, on our minds and bodies to help us feel more connected, to help us reduce grief, et cetera. Um, but when you're home, on a computer screen, these technologies were not designed for that environment. And so the yeah. secret language of the brain that they use wasn't available to them. I mean, even again, thinking about Shiva, one of the amazing things of Shiva is people will sit on low chairs or on the ground. And those of you who have done this know that uh, that can start to cause some, some back pain, some, some knee pain. You get up and you welcome someone and it goes away. There's actually scientific research showing that mild onsets and offsets of discomfort like that reduces grief, reduces rumination. If you're sitting in front of your computer screen, that's not happening, right? You know, self-focus reduced self-focus reduces yeah. you're okay. wearing your pajamas <laughs> right you're wearing your pajamas or yeah. self-focus if we're on zoom mm -hmm. right i i have i i'm it's like i'm looking in a mirror i see my face right there in front of me all the time and so it, it became the, the pandemic not only caused a lot of pain but it scrambled all these practices that help us deal with that anxiety and that pain um i'm not sure that I that I completely understand this question, but I want I want to throw it at you and and see how you respond. This is from Karen. If we believe that the creator knows what potential the creation has, how do we build a human structure that supports the best of what we can be rather than bring out our inhuman nature? 
And I guess another way to think about that is, you know, how do you see the application in secular society um, of these observations science is making yeah. about the benefits of religious practices? Yeah, well, for a long time, you know, a lot of a lot of philosophers, folks like like Dan Dennett or Steve Pinker have said, well, yeah, all the benefits just come from people getting together. And you can do that without church or without religion. But the newest data that's coming out suggests that not, yes, socialization helps people. We're, we're social creatures. But the true benefits come from engagement in these spiritual practices, not just let's hang out as a club. And the reason why, again, is because of all of these ritual elements that, that bind people together. The belief that relax. So, you know, there is this, there's wonderful neuroscience research that shows the, the stronger your, your faith is, stress you have when you face important decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when you're trying to think about what should I do, where am I going to go? You want to make the best decision you can. But at a certain point saying, okay, I, I'm just going to trust that this will, this will work out, reduces the anxiety that we're always putting ourselves under. Um, and so when you combine all the elements of rituals together to bring people connection and peace and happiness, um, there's a lot more there than just a club. I think of it as, you know, a club that is taking their medicine. <laughs> and the, the analogy I use is, is, is a purposeful one because I call this religio prospecting in the book. So when the pharmaceutical right. companies are looking for, for new drugs, they oftentimes will go to traditional cultures and say, what do you use to cure X? And sure, many of them don't do what they're supposed to, but we found wonderful drugs in that way to cure cancers and, and other things. Why are we not doing that mm -hmm. to try and find ways to help people deal with grief, to be happier, mm -hmm. to be less lonely? Mm -hmm. And as you say, you know, with uh, mindfulness and meditation have absolutely been um, adapted and studied for stress reduction, but I think you're also saying there's so many other forms of stress reduction that yeah, happen. Yeah, there are. Exactly. And, you know, I was, Across the traditions. I was talking to, to a Buddhist Lama the other day and he said, yes, he says, you know, uh, mindfulness will reduce your stress, but that's not its purpose. Its purpose is to reduce suffering of others. And mindfulness right. is inward focused to be outward focused, to act right. in the world in a positive way. Um, and I think, you know, if we don't, if we don't do it the right way, if we mix mindfulness it, as opposed to studying it in, in the way that it was traditionally taught, we're going to lose those powerful benefits of it. And there's a, there's a, um, a comment from Gloria. Um, I wonder how you would comment on, because, you know, there, there, is there a difference also between those who engage in religious activity, perhaps deep, deeply traditional, um, but that that is done by rote rather than mindfully. I mean, is is it is, yeah. is there a quality of attention that brings all these benefits um, to life? Yeah, you, you have to. So the data suggests that that not only do you have to do it, but you have to you have to want to do it. If you do it and you go through the motions and your mind is a million miles away, mm. you're, you you will get some benefit from it. Um, you know, there are some benefits in the way you you chant and you breathe that that will affect your body. But to get the full benefit of it, you have to bring intention to it. That's how you, that's how the tools work on your mind. When you give them your full intention, when you're fully present, they cultivate the right emotions. They form the connections to other people around you. They can infuse your body and mind. And that's what these actually are, again, to use your term spiritual technologies. When you take a pill, it works on your body and that it works on your mind. When you do these actions, when you call these emotions to mind, when you interact with other people in the ways these rituals specify, it's changing your nervous system. It's changing what your mind is thinking. It's changing what you're feeling. And it's working in a much more complex and beautiful way than a pill ever could. Hmm. Here's an interesting question. I'm really curious to know how you how you answer this from your science. Um, why is it that the commitment to living more meaningfully and generously fades at some time after Shiva? Why doesn't it persist? I think it's because we get back into our daily, our daily routines, right? And in our culture, especially, we tend to 
hide death, right? We, we, mm-hmm. we take our seniors and we put them away in, in, in nursing homes or we're not living uh, in life or even in agricultural communities where you would see death, even of animals normally. And I think for most of us, when we hide the fact of death, we go on back to that normal phase of me, me, I, I need to get ahead in life. And so we're reminded again that death could come for us sooner than we think, as you might be going to Shiva, going to a funeral or a wake, having ashes put on your head, saying to dust, you will turn, saying the Unitana Toka. If you're a Buddhist, you meditate on death. And so that is why I think it is people who do these rituals, who are engaged in their faith, they come into contact with these ideas and these rituals more. And it's not, mm-hmm. I'm just going to sugar for my friend this month, and then I'm not going to think about anything related to that for the next 10 months. Mm-hmm. And don't you think that that Western, modern Western science has something to do with our dismissal of death? You know, if you think about, you know, the hospice movement is so young, and part of what it had to overcome was was the way death in 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 Western medicine was treated essentially like a failure, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is treated like a failure as opposed to kind of a normal as a failure of science. As yeah. failure of science, yeah, as yeah. A failure of the doctors to be able to keep you alive, yeah. as opposed to a normal stage of life. And 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 because of that, what happens too is is when you are when your time is coming, there's this sense of wait. Maybe it's not. Maybe I can do something. Maybe there's another treatment. And I think that puts a lot of people in this state of anxiety as opposed to more, you know, traditional rituals that are surrounding death when you when you know your time is coming. They are meant to calm the person, to prepare the person for what comes next, depending upon what you believe, going to heaven, rebirth, whatever it might be. It's to make that transition mm-hmm. as peaceful and as as comfortable as possible. And, you know, that's why all the rituals, whether it's Hindu, Christian, Jewish, whatever it might be, people are home. They want to be home, not in the hospital. They're usually surrounded by loved ones who are singing or chanting with them or, or engaging in, in, in remembrances. Um, and that's what gives them the peace to make that transition because death is inevitable. And as you're mm-hmm. saying, if we try to deny that in science, it, it does feel like a failure. Mm-hmm. Um, what is the state of research? I, I, I don't think this is, this isn't precisely what you study, but mm-hmm. I, I suspect that it's something you're aware of, of um, how are we hardwired for spirituality um, or hardwired to, yeah. to how, how, what, and also even hardwired, I mean, even this word God, um, to believe in God, um, to, to, I don't, to make religion, yeah. Yeah, I I don't know that anyone knows the answer. I mean, it is clearly the case because we, you will see religious faith the world over, right? Um, and, I, you know, I, I don't want to say we're necessarily wired for it. I mean, we are wired for it, but could, you know, is that because God made us that way or is that because we evolved that way? I can't tell you the answer, but I can tell you this. Even if you are a complete atheist and you look at the evolutionary models, what they show is that people who, in the long run, who are kind, who are generous, who are fair, have the best outcomes. People always say, Dave, if I want to get ahead in life, should I be a good person or should I be a jerk? I say, well, what's your time frame? If you want to get ahead very quickly, you can be a jerk. You Mm. You can cheat people. You can be rude. You can be demanding. But over time you're going to lose those connections that bring happiness and bring resources and make life worth living. And so religion in some ways is the tool to help us stay on that right track, to help nudge our better angels. And again, you can think of it as if if we are here because of God, God gave us these tools to help his, her, or its creations live better lives. If we're here based on evolution alone, then we have these capacities and we and we create religion because it brings out our better angels, which helps us live as a better society. The point that we always get in arguments about is, is religion good or bad? Mm-hmm. Religion, these practices, what you do are powerful tools. Whether they can be used for good or bad, that depends upon the intentions of the institutions using them. Mm-hmm. But on average, they're powerful tools to make life better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are a, there are a few questions, or you know, 
observations about the benefits of religion that you are mm -hmm. highlighting and um you know the fact that there are i, I think that there are also terrible things that happen yeah there are the terrible things that happen and and you know what i always say is is if, if you take away the theology take away the institution if, if you look at the practices they're tools that nudge our bodies and minds that can move us to do things that are that are very important effortful and powerful for good or for bad the intentions depend upon the person. Now, Richard Dawkins, one of the most famous atheists out there, new atheists out there, will say the same thing about science. It's it's a set mm -hmm. of tools. If you right. want to find the way to cure COVID, it's your best friend. If you want mm -hmm. to find the way to kill the most people the most efficiently, mm -hmm. science is your friend. Mm -hmm. And so I think if we if we separate the practices and the tools from the in institutions that use them, there are there are that that argument goes away. But it raises another one, which is people are leaving faiths in droves right now, traditional faiths. This is the first year right. since Gallup started asking the question that the majority of Americans said, I don't belong to a mosque, a temple, or a church. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of good reasons, as you're noting. People are leaving issues of scandal, abuse, gender, gender discrimination, et cetera. But when you leave these faiths, we're also leaving behind the tools that help us meet life, which is why most people who are leaving the institutions aren't becoming non-religious, the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, mm -hmm. are looking for new ways to be spiritual. I know, Christy, you know, you've you've been at the vanguard of this um, with a lot of the groups that you're you're working with to try and find new ways to be spiritual. And I guess that that speaks to that wiring that we know we need this. We know it helps us thrive in life. What's the best way to do it? That's the question. Mm -hmm. I also find, and I wonder if you see this also, that um when people get serious about um, spiritual inquiry and, and building their spiritual life, they often end up at some point gravitating back towards the traditions in mm -hmm. some way. I mean, I really feel like the nuns, the N-O-N-E-S, um, who many of whom, and you have said this too, are so, um, so alive to this. They are, they are not just spiritually, but also I think often very theologically curious. They might be the best hope of, the renewal of our traditions that are declining. In yeah, this I mean, every religion that's here started because somebody thought they had a better way. And the ones that last are the ones that find the ways to speak to us, to connect us, to help us find our, our better selves and feel like we're, we're attached to something larger and, and greater than us. And that use those use those technologies, which, which is why I'm, I'm always, you know, People, if you go to Silicon Valley now, ritual design is the big thing. You want a ritual yeah. for your new startup, we'll create you one. But, you know, is that the best way to create a ritual? No, yeah. you have to look to the tradition. Some people, as you say, become more orthodox. They 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 look for the old Latin mass or, or more orthodox methods of Judaism. Other people are trying to take elements and create something new with them. But the ones mm -hmm. that last are going to be the ones that use these practices to leverage our bodies and minds in ways that that bring us peace, bring us growth, help us find connection mm -hmm. to one another. Mm -hmm. And also, I I think this runs through your book, bringing us into service. That 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 is a hallmark of of a life that that is happy in the deepest sense. Yeah, I mean, you know, service to one another. And again, this is why all religions, I think, emphasize it is is just the way to ensure happiness. I mean, you can think even in a very self-serving way, you can think about it. Well, if I'm helping you now, you'll help me tomorrow. And that is true. But when you look at the models, we all gain more than we give because I may give to seven people, but in the larger community, they're all going to give back to me. Mm -hmm. And it's the way emotionally, physically, in terms of everything that, that, that the most, the most gets done. And a lot of rituals are designed to help us help us feel that sense of, of connection that makes us willing to engage with other people in that way. And, and it's just so interesting that you're studying this now, right? That science is actually yeah, I, investigating I, that phenomenon. We are. And, you know, like I said, we, we found ways to make people feel more, more compassionate by having them move in time. We found if we make people feel grateful, they'll, they'll become more patient, generous, et cetera. Um, and it's just amazing to me that, 
all of these things are being used. You know, one of my favorites, again, to get just to go to, to, to morning rituals is when we think about it, all morning rituals involve this, this sense of eulogizing, right? We say what's wonderful about the person we've lost. And it's normal. It feels normal. But if you think about it, it's kind of weird, right? So if I just lost my job that I really loved, Mm. Or a friend who I care deeply about just decided they didn't want to be my friend anymore. I wouldn't want to think about how wonderful they were, how wonderful that job was. It would hurt all the more. Mm. But yet when we think about how wonderful a person is who's passed, it makes us feel better. And there's new psychological research from, from George Bonanno at Columbia University that shows the ability to create a positive memory of the person who has passed is a big predictor of who is going to move through grief in a more resilient way. The people who can't do that have more depression, more anxiety, more rumination. So again, you can see this built into every ritual. How did how did they know that? I, I don't know. We just figured out this in data in the last 10 years, but it's been right. being used for millennia, right? Yeah. So. There's a question here. I wonder if... Um... If you if you have this kind of conversation with people, mm. it's kind of approaching you as a as a rabbi of sorts. Uh, the question is: My thirty year old daughter says she's an atheist and has therefore cut herself off from her Judaism and the Jewish community. Yeah, but this talk is illustrating the positive aspects of religious ideas and ritual. Do you need to believe in God to gain them? Do I talk to my daughter? about re-engaging in her religion and religious ritual? Well, you know, it's it's an interesting question. There, there's there been, I'm sure many of you heard of a kind of a big brouhaha at, at, at Harvard because the new chaplain is a, is a humanistic member yes. of humanistic yeah, Judaism, which basically writes, it, it's very atheistic, but recognizes and keeps all the ritual traditions of Judaism. So there's bar and bat mitzvahs, there's shiva, there's all of the things that go, Yom Kippur services. Um, because what they realize is that these shared traditions bind us together, bring us joy, limit our grief, help us together traverse the road of life in a more in a more resilient way. And so what I would say to her is, you know, whether or not she believes in in God, that's a hard sell because that that relies on on faith, right? You, you have to take it on faith one way or the other. Um, but there's clear evidence that these practices are meaningful and don't just take it from me, take it from humanistic Judaism and, and, and people who, who do that, that the power of these rituals uh, to make life better is just immense. You know, the, the other thing that we see nowadays that's becoming popular is, you know, people are, are taking a lot of psychedelics to get a transcendent experience. And anyone who's done this transcendent experience can be the most beautiful thing in the world. When, when you sense your ego dissolve, you feel connection and joy. But it can also be terrifying to feel your ego mm -hmm. dissolve. And when people, you know, take magic mushrooms or, or drink ayahuasca in the traditional ceremonies, there's shamans there and there's chanting and rhythmic drumming and things that put your mind and heart rate and breathing in a state as a scaffold that make you feel mm -hmm. comfortable, that make you feel safe. So when that moment of, of transcendence comes and ego death comes, it's beautiful. If you're drinking ayahuasca with your, you know, friend, the, the Brooklyn hipster, without all this other stuff that goes with it, the odds that it can go bad go mm -hmm. up. You know, and Michael Pollan always talks about, you know, 8% of people who who, have, who take psilocybin um, have not only a negative, but a experience, but one that actually leads them to seek psychiatric treatment. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because those, those ritual scaffolds aren't there as guardrails. So you can't extract the chemical, right, right. from the ritual technology that goes around it to make it work. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm curious. Um, I've always believed that the the science religion debate or uh, the science religion hostility is neither true to the history of science nor to the history of religion. Um, and in fact, it's it's not it's it's not true to most religious traditions um, around the world, or even most of Christianity. Um, but I, but, but, and yet I, I feel like we are also in a time when, um, mostly because of what's happening in science, um, that, that must evolve. I mean, I'm just, I feel like, you know, you use the language of a period of a interdisciplinary inquiry between mm -hmm. science and religion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, how do you see that? It, do you, and also, do you think that, that, um, a new mindset is emerging more broadly within science? I mean, how is your 
science seen um, in other parts. I mean, really, science is is a vast part of the human yeah, enterprise, yeah, right? It's not yeah. one thing. But I think you understand my question. I I do, and and you're right. It it has gone through different stages, and and you know we, we can't paint it with a big brush. I mean, you know, the Vatican itself has an observatory and and and, and does scientific work, and and many yeah. Jewish organizations do too, as well as many other religions. The Dalai Lama funds a lot of a lot of neuroscience research. Um, I think it's hard to say. Um, but the one area where I think it should be happening is the science, the social sciences, how, how mm. we treat one another, how we, how we find joy, how we deal with calamity. These are problems that, that religion was meant to solve. You know, if you're a physicist and, and you want to debate about the nature of the cosmos and the big bang and did God do that, that's a harder one because there's no real data that we can have, but here we have the data. And what I'm trying to do is, is, is to create a space to bring people together. And I'm not the only one by any means. There are, there are lots of, lots of folks doing this. Those of you who were here last night, Rabbi Jeff Middleman runs an organization to bring scientists and religious leaders together. But what we have to push back on are, I think the scientists who are out there saying that, you know, all of religion is superstition and a, and a, and a plague on, Mm -hmm. on, on the mind, because what it does is it prevents younger scientists from saying, Hey, this is something that, that I want to do. I don't, I don't want to be kind of looked at by my peers in this way. And so, you know, I'm an old guy, right? I, I can have, I'm, I'm comfortable. It's all with my relative. Position. Remember, I already said that. It's all relative. That. But what I want to do, right, is, is, is to bring them together. Because if you look at the data, there is no doubt that these practices have power and we can learn from them. And there are, you know, pastors and rabbis who want to learn from science. You know, I had people say to me last year, I was trying to adapt my congregation to, to doing things remotely. And I didn't know what types of techniques work the best. Maybe science could help me figure that out, right? As things rapidly change. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we can have a respectful conversation and, and put our isms aside, but respect them, but work on what we want to work on and know has power together without debating what the origin of that power is. Mm -hmm. So I just want to ask you one final question that the title of the book is How God Works. Um, I think even and especially for the most devout, um, the word God is too small to contain what, mm-hmm. what is pointed at, uh, experienced, shared uh, in these rituals and in these traditions. Um, and I'm curious, um, and I also, I also find scientists, interestingly, you know, Einstein used the word God a lot, Um, often jokingly, but he did speak about the mind behind the universe or um, what was it? You know, he, when he, he said, uh, God does not play dice with the universe and he wasn't actually speaking about God, but, but he used the language and he invoked the language of God and I'm, and, 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 and beyond just the language, I'm curious um, through the science you've done, but also in the writing of this book, um, how did that reshape or different, give different substance to what you mean when you use that word, God? Yeah, that's a good question. I, so, you know, I started out, I was raised Catholic. I was an altar boy. Um, I, as I became a scientist, I kind of ignored most of, of, of religion. And I was probably on the border of being an atheist agnostic. Now, I, I don't know exactly what I believe or how I conceive of God. But what I will tell you is that to me, I am, I am open to the possibility that there is something greater out there than I can conceive of. What form it takes, I don't know, but I am sure that whatever form it takes, it it is available to all of us. And which is why I I see the commonalities in all of these rituals. In the book, I look at all the different commonalities in all the different religions, because I think we're all aiming toward the same place of happiness, of, of peace, of, of trying to find connection and support for each other. And we're wired to do that. And we're wired to do that by evolution too. Now, whether that evolution was put in, started by God or not, I can't tell you, but I, I see this as an all encompassing thing, which is why just to return to your point, you said, we see religion everywhere. Hmm. I think it's because it's the tool that we need and we're leaving it for institutionally some good reasons now and society is changing rapidly but if we don't find a new way to come together 
I worry that we're going to have problems. I don't think it's as bad as Nietzsche said. I don't think we're going to be completely amoral. You can be, you can be moral without religion, but I think we're going to have, we're going to be missing something in here that brings mm-hmm. us that peace, joy, happiness, and connection. And isn't it interesting that in a time of waning um, institutions, I mean, all of our institutions are in trouble, right? Our our religious institutions are in flux, just like all of our institutions. But in this very time, um, science like yours is shining this uh, generative light on this part of our experience. Um, So I want to thank the Stryker Center for having us tonight. and, And thank you, David, for writing this book. And it was such a such a fascinating conversation and great questions. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.